Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session, Podcasting the Dissertation, which is a presentation by Anna Williams and Judith Pascoe. I'm Mary Chapman. I'm the Academic Director of the Public Humanities Hub, and we are the sponsors of this event. It's a two-part event that explores the podcast as a form of public scholarship with an emphasis on the dissertation. And it's been organized by the Hub's Grad Committee. So I'd like to introduce them to you now. Sydney Lines and Heidi Rennert are PhD students in the English department. And Gillian Glass is a PhD student in Classics, Near Eastern and Religious Studies. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting this session about podcasting dissertations from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, where knowledge has been exchanged orally for millennia. Many of you are attending this session from other unceded territories, and we invite you to post those in the chat. I'd like to explain the format for this afternoon. In the first part of this event, Dr. Anna Williams will present on her scholarly podcast, My Gothic Dissertation. This will be followed by a Q&A that will include her doctoral supervisor, Dr. Judith Pascoe. Please feel free to pop your questions in the chat. And then after the Q&A, probably around 3.30, we'll take a short break. We'll come back at four, but we'll come back on two different links uh, for two concurrent breakout sessions. One that's in, intended for grad students with Anna Williams, and the other intended for university faculty and admin to meet with Dr. Pasco to discuss the logistics process and challenges of producing and advising the podcast dissertation. So this first part, the public and uh, the public part will be recorded. Recorded. The breakout sessions are private and they won't be recorded. So Heather will post the links to these two breakout sessions in the chat later, later in the first part. So everybody has uh, the link to where they're going next. One final announcement before we begin. This event is the first in a series of, um, uh, of sorry, this event is the first in a series sponsored by the Public Humanities Hub Graduate Committee on public scholarship and graduate education. So our next event is a round table on reimagining humanities grad programs, forms of grad scholarship and graduate career diversity and professional development. And that's taking place on February 25th at 1230. If you go to publichumanities.ubc.ca you'll find the information there. Now to begin part one of our program by introducing our speakers. Dr. Anna Williams earned her PhD in English from the University of Iowa in 2019. She produced the first ever doctoral thesis in podcast form titled My Gothic Dissertation. She now works as an associate producer at Dustlight Productions. Dr. Judith Pascoe is now the George Mills Harper Professor of English at Florida State University. She's published Romantic Theatricality, Gender, Poetry, and Spectatorship from Cornell. She's published The Hummingbird Cabinet, A Rare and Curious History of Romantic Collectors, also from Cornell, and the Sarah Siddons Audio Files, Romanticism and the Lost Voice from University of Michigan. She's also published in Public Books, The American Scholar, and The Hudson Review. And her most recent book, On the Bullet Train with Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights in Japan, which was completed with the support of a Guggenheim Fellowship, explores how and why Bronte's novel has been embraced by Japanese readers and writers. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to Anna Williams. Um, hi, everyone. First, I want to thank Dr. Chapman for inviting me to share my work with you today. 
and thanks also to everyone at the Pub Hub, as I have learned it is called, uh, for helping me to or for helping to coordinate. It's also my pleasure to thank my co-presenter, Dr. Judith Pasco, for being with me today and for serving as the co-chair of my Gothic dissertation. Without her support, I'm not sure the project would exist. A little preface, I'm going to be reading my thoughts to you because that's what I would do if I was in person. Um, but writing for the ear is kind of my job, so hopefully it's not boring. Um, okay, so let me start sharing my screen with you. All right, Judith, give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Cool, thank you. All right, so speaking of my, goth my Gothic dissertation, um, I wanna start with a brief introduction for those of you who aren't familiar. So hopefully you can hear me play this trailer. Judith, give me a thumbs up when I hit play if it's working. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Welcome to my Gothic dissertation, my actual dissertation on Gothic fiction, and the first dissertation ever to be produced in podcast form. In it, I report on what it's really like to be in grad school. I ended up crying in the stacks of the library because it was just really designed to make me feel worthless and it worked. And all of the ways it feels like being trapped in a 19th century gothic novel. There is always darkness. There is always the threat of falling through a trapdoor or finding oneself in a lower level. I'm Anna Williams, and as your narrator on this journey, I'll take you along on my real-life quest to complete my PhD in English and escape the grad school gothic castle for good. On this quest, I invite you to listen in on some of the horror stories PhD students circulate behind closed doors. This person either loves you or he hates you, and he'll decide really quickly, and there's really no making it up if he hates you. To be a fly on the wall during my own committee meetings. You are not <laughs> developing here a, a, uh, a suitable framework for suggesting. And to hear education experts weigh in on the old school training practices that can make the ivory tower feel like an inhospitable, even terrifying place to those who don't traditionally belong. You have to prove that you deserve to be part of this very selective community. Along our journey, we'll also detour through the pages of some classic Gothic novels, catching up with fictional heroes on their own educational journeys in the mysteries of Udolpho. Emily gazed with melancholy awe upon the castle. Charlotte Bronte's Villette. Tell it not in Gaff, I believe I was crying. And of course, Frankenstein. How can I delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? All leading up to the defense of my own Frankensteinian creature that's part dissertation, part documentary, and all grad school gothic. Subscribe to My Gothic. I'll um, spare you the subscription uh, details, but they will be on one of the slides, so. All right, um, let's see. So to re reiterate the high points, um, this was my actual dissertation on Gothic fiction, which I completed and defended in May of 2019 at the University of Iowa. Usually, as I'm sure we all know, a dissertation is a manuscript for a monograph, a book-length study of a specialized subject, but mine is a podcast, which is a form that also lends itself well to an intensive study of a specialized subject. In my Gothic dissertation, I jokingly compare being in grad school to being trapped in a Gothic novel. The tone is tongue-in-cheek, but there is some real critical bite. It's a mini-series that includes seven episodes. In the first episode, the prologue, I tell the story of my dissertation prospectus meeting, which took place in 2017, in which I pitch my dissertation idea to my committee. In the intro and next four chapters, I do my reading of 19th century Gothic novels as stories of education, and I weave in documentary about real life grad school horror stories. In the epilogue, I take you into the room of my dissertation defense and talk about what happened next. So I released this podcast publicly this past summer, summer of 2020. And since then it's received 
Um, the analytics are a little bit shaky for podcasts, but um, I, I, I want to preface this number with that. <laughs> According to some sources, it has received over 8,000 unique listens spread across 50 countries. Back in December, it was named to the Bello Collective's Top 100 Podcasts of 2020, and it was reviewed by podcast editors at The Guardian and El País, among other places. And besides being successful with popular audiences, it's also made headway in the scholarly world. An article from the introduction and first chapter were published in Gothic Studies this summer, um, which is the flagship journal for that field. I'm overcoming my genuine and extreme discomfort with self promotion to tell you all of this um, because I think it's important to show that the, that it is possible to talk to both scholarly and public audiences at once. Um, there is an audience for this kind of work. There are professional opportunities for this kind of work and we should be encouraging our grad students to do more of it. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through the how and the why of this creature. And for those of you who have listened, you. Uh, you'll know that I do a lot of comparing myself to Victor Frankenstein um, and my dissertation to his monster, um, though I do actually prefer, prefer the term creature, um, more sympathetic. Okay, so without further ado, I bring you to the title of my presentation, Behind the Podcast or How I Did It by Anna Williams. This image, of course, is a still from Mel Brooks's classic movie, Young Frankenstein, um, which also features in the podcast, um, in which the fictional grandson of Victor Frederick Frankenstein ventures into his dead grandfather's infamous laboratory in search of his secrets. And there he finds this comedically titled how-to manual. Um, so consider this presentation a dusty old book in some cobweb dungeon. <laughs> um, and because I want you to know what you're in for, and I can't resist hilariously long 18th century titles, the second subtitle is a presentation in four parts. So let's start with part one, The Fortress of Fear. Um, it's about grad school. Uh, but before we get there, I want to tell you why I decided to go to grad school in the first place. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, which is the largest city in the state, and for the most part, a bright blue dot in an otherwise conservative place. One of the wonderful things about Birmingham is that it's home to the liberal arts college where I earned my, graduate, my undergraduate degree, Birmingham Southern College. As the child of two parents who had not gone to college themselves, attending this little liberal arts haven was personally very transformative for me. Um, I knew I wanted to study humanity and what makes us, us. So I started out as a psychology major actually. Um, but about halfway through, after taking the required intermediate writing course in the English department, I became smitten with reading and writing and thinking in the humanities and made the switch to English. I felt really nurtured and supported by the faculty who challenged me to think more deeply and change my perspective in a lot of ways. And I'm still in close touch with many of them. After I graduated in 2008, I was kind of adrift and I felt pulled to return to that sense of purpose and meaning that I had felt in my undergraduate studies in English. So I applied for master's degrees and I ended up down the road at the University of Alabama in 2009. What happened next looked like this. Enter the fortress of fear. <laughs> Um, I think it was a combination of going from a private liberal arts school to a big research university, plus the recommendations being put out by the MLA at the time to make sure incoming grad students knew the reality of the academic job market. But the first weeks and maybe even months of my intro to grad studies course were the opposite of nurturing or welcoming. <laughs> It was like a get out now while you can kind of situation. And I was really confused. They had just accepted me to this program. They had given me a fellowship to study there. And then it felt like this jolting stark environment of like, we don't really think you should be here. Or at least that's how the message came across to me. And that had the effect of intensifying my experience of that ever present specter of grad school, imposter syndrome. <laughs> Anxiety. Feeling like no matter how hard I worked, no matter how many conferences I attended or how many articles I published or how many extra prof professionalizing tasks I put in, I would never succeed. 
This continued through my master's degree and on into my PhD, which I decided to pursue in 2013, because again, I could not find a job that felt fulfilling after my master's and I was totally adrift. It was only through adjuncting and being in a college classroom again that I felt like I was doing something meaningful. So I moved to Iowa and started all over. But the anxiety and imposter syndrome continued to haunt me because I felt like there was exactly one path to success and it was a tenure track job and I would never, ever, 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 ever in a million years get one. Um, and I could tell that all of my grad professors and advisors were anguished by this too. I'm sure they had experienced disappointments themselves watching their students um, graduate and fall off of a cliff into an abyss of no academic jobs. So the whole get out now while you still can message was I'm sure an attempt to save themselves from this pain as well. But eventually, after I got past the point of my comps exam, which itself felt like a gothic experience, <laughs> I had just really had enough of the anxiety and of the imposter syndrome. I was tired of feeling beholden to the academic job market. And from what I was seeing at my own university, it didn't seem like I was gonna be that happy doing the whole publish or perish tenure thing anyway. Um, so <laughs> I thought enough was enough and I took a good hard look at all of the highly valuable skills that I was earning that everyone was kind of taking for granted. Because they may seem like a dime a dozen on the academic job market, but other industries should count themselves very lucky to have employees with the level of deep training that PhD students get in these areas. Um, and I've listed some of them here, but I'm sure there's many more that I'm missing. Um, complex and nuanced communication, collegiality, which is something that like, I think people get backwards about PhDs. People think that PhDs can't work with other people because we're so used to being like in a hole doing research and writing on our own. But um, I have found that the collegiality training I found as I, I gained through just being a good citizen of my cohort and my department um, is really actually very transferable and invaluable. Um, so collegiality classroom skills that include presenting information, facilitating groups and generally managing people who are learning something you already know how to do. Um, those are all very valuable outside of the classroom as well. Um, okay, what else? Uh, okay, also generally just thinking critically and analytically and doing it quickly and thoroughly. Um, so to continue with the metaphor of the Gothic, this image on the right, is uh, from the frontispiece of The Mysteries of Udolpho in 1806, and it depicts the heroine Emily St. Aubert finally just looking behind this black veil that she's been scared to look behind for so long, and that was me, like explaining the supernatural to myself um, when it comes to imposter syndrome and all that anxiety. Um, I just finally um, looked past that veil and recognized that it was holding me back, and um, I had all these skills that were transferable. Anyway, so one of the major skills that I felt I had in abundance and that I started to really ponder how I could use was all of this experience with stories as an English PhD student. For years, I had been reading stories, thinking about stories, talking about them, writing about them, teaching students, to read, think, talk, and write about them. And I felt like I had given, it had given me this really deep intuitive understanding of what makes stories meaningful and well told or the and like belief in my ability to say that, like to come up with reasons why stories are meaningful and well told, um, particular ones. So um, I felt like this was really important uh, and could lead to something really fulfilling for me. So now I'm going to leave you on this gothic cliffhanger. Um, this is me on the left dangling over the fortress of fear. Um, at any moment being threatened to be pushed over the edge by the deadline for my dissertation prospectus, which was always drawing ever nearer. Um, okay, but for now, we're going to do something completely different. That is part two.
um, of this presentation in four parts. And I am calling this part, Podcasts, A Love Story. So on the left is me, obviously, on an airplane, unmasked because it was 2015, um, which now looks really weird. But on the right is Ira Glass, host of This American Life. In case you're not familiar, This American Life is an hour-long radio program that started out in Chicago in 1995 and is now broadcast on probably every public radio station in the U.S. They were also pioneers in distributing their public radio show in podcast form. Um, and for years now, each of their weekly podcast episodes gets downloaded, gets downloaded by millions of listeners. Um, I discovered it in 2009, way behind the curve, um, <laughs> but that's when this love story begins. But lest you think that it's actually Ira Glass that I'm in love with, um, I put in this slide, which features a picture on the left of my now husband, Joseph Chapel, who is the actual person who introduced me to This American Life in 2009. Um, he actually did it through the TV show, um, of which this image is like a promotional ad for. Um, but nevertheless, I started listening um, to the podcast very soon after. And he uh, graduated a year before I did. He was a, a fellow grad student, a fellow uh, inhabitant of the, the Fortress of Fear, I guess. And he left a year before I did and moved from Tuscaloosa, which is where the University of Alabama is, to Nashville. And I had a four hour drive um, to go and see him. And so that gave me a lot of time to listen to podcasts and especially This American Life. Okay. <clears throat> So here I'm going to start sharing some of the brilliant work that's been done on the podcast boom that started with This American Life. The graphic novelist Jessica Abel published this brilliant how-to guide for podcasters out on the wire in 2015. And in it, she talks a lot about how This American Life created such fertile ground for people working in this form. Um, she even goes so far as to say radio, especially public radio and the podcasts that have sprung from it, is the most fertile ground for narrative nonfiction in the English language media, which is a huge claim. Um, but just take a look at some of the fruits of that fertile ground. Podcasts that have followed in This American Life's footsteps include Serial, S-Town, Invisibilia, and everything that Gimlet Media has ever produced because Gimlet Media was founded by Alex Bloomberg, who is a colleague of the This American Life team and was a contributor. Um, okay, so Jessica Abel's claim that uh, the radio or podcast form is, quote, the most fertile ground for narrative nonfiction really actually seems believable when you consider um, that as of 2017, the first two seasons of Serial had been downloaded more than 250 million times. And that was three years ago. Like I couldn't find more recent numbers than that. Um, but how many copies of New York Times nonfiction bestsellers do we think are being sold uh, per year? I, I am not really great with huge numbers, but I don't think that it's 250 million copies. Um, and I'm not, I don't, I don't trot those numbers out to be like one is better than the other, but I'm just saying like people are really consuming narrative nonfiction in podcast form at a rate that they don't always consume it in written form. Um, anyway, um, as of this summer, White Fragility has sold somewhere around 800,000 copies. So there you go, I did look up, <laughs> I did look up a number. Um, they're not exact analogs, but you get the idea. Um, so what accounts for the success of these nonfiction podcasts? What do they all have in common? Um, these are a few of the things that Jessica Abel lists as part of that magic um, combination, that fertilizer, I guess, if you will. <laughs> um, so she discusses the method by which they're put together as um, one of the factors of their success. So they're put together by a highly collaborative process in which everyone feels courageous to be vulnerable and share creative ideas. They're also comfortable presenting information multimodally and with a general DIY spirit. This is something that I love. The next one. Um, they recognize the value of blending genres. As Abel says in this panel, people in the podcasting industry come from all kinds of different backgrounds, including music, theater, and they don't all just come straight out of journalism. 
doing this kind of work takes a lot of imagination and self-knowledge, as well as openness to feedback, given all that collaboration. Um, and all of these things, by the way, I think are totally cultivated in the ideal humanities classroom as well. So I think it's good training for this kind of work. Um, but maybe most importantly, Abel says that these podcast producers have attained such huge success for their shows because, quote, they speak to us with recognizable voices and sound like real human beings, allowing us to connect to their stories through the passion we hear. Then she goes on to say, this feels so right to us today when authority comes from directness and authenticity, not distance and formality. This is really a huge claim about the nature of authority, but I think that she's on to something. Um, the, I mean, obviously there's been populist waves sweeping across the world for a while now, um, but in the context of academia, there've been all of these long overdue efforts to become more inclusive of our conception of what counts as knowledge and how it's attained. I think um, we're finally shifting away from an enlightenment, enlightenment model of objectivity um, that was created for and by a bunch of white upper class middle uh, upper class men of several centuries ago and into a model that's attempting to make room for the full spectrum of lived human experience and in the humanities when that's what we study making room for the full spectrum of human experience um, as part of our knowledge culture i think that's pretty vital um, but back to the nuts and bolts of podcast methodology From the Godfather, Ira Glass himself, uh, we get a simple equation, and he puts this in the, another great book about um, the podcasting boom called Reality Radio. Um, okay, so in yellow, you'll see um, this equation highlighted. He says, I usually think of a radio story as having two basic parts to it. There's the plot, where a person has some sort of experience, and then there are moments of reflection where this person or another character in the story or the narrator says something interesting about what's happened. So basically there's a story and then there's someone who interprets that story <laughs> or draws conclusions, as he says. Then, okay, so down the page, underlined in red, Ira tells us how vital that second part is. A person can walk through lava cure a disease, find true love, lose true love, discover he was adopted, discover he was not adopted, have all manner of amazing experiences, but if he or the narrator can't say something big and surprising about what that experience means, if the story doesn't lead to some interesting idea about how the world works, then it doesn't work for radio. Or anyway, it's not gonna be as powerful as the best radio stories. So basically, he says that no matter how good the story is, if you don't have a skilled interpreter to tell you why that story is good, why it means something really powerful and what that powerful something is, then the radio story doesn't work. His formula for blockbuster podcasting relies on a powerful interpreter of stories. Big time revelation coming up <laughs> for me in three, two, one, in part three, um, which is titled with a Frankenstein quotation, um, Victor, at, after he finds um, the works of Cornelius Agrippa and starts reading them and, and learning all this occult magic um, that he later uses to bring his creature to life. Anyway, he says, a new light seemed to dawn upon my mind. And so that's where we are in my story too. Ooh, there we go. So to remind you where we last left off, we're here back in the Fortress of Fear, um, with me dangling over the precipice, threatening to be pushed over the edge by my looming dissertation prospectus deadline. To escape that scary mental place of not knowing what to do with my dissertation, which was really a product of not, doing, not knowing what to do with my PhD training after deciding that I didn't want to pursue an academic job, I would escape to my neighborhood streets. Um, I would take long walks. And of course, I'd listen to podcasts. On one particular day, I happened to be listening to This American Life, number 583. It'll make sense when you're older. And in Act 3, um, which is titled Middle Age, the guest host, 
Hannah Jaffe Walt talks to Ira Glass about lessons he learned in his 30s. During their conversation, he says, every moment I was either working or asleep. Like those were the two things I did and I didn't have a problem with it. A normal listener might feel really sorry for him <laughs> and his lack of work-life balance. Um, but honestly, I heard that and thought, God, it would be so great to have a job that I loved that much. That's really all I want. And then I remembered that whole experience with stories thing, all of the reading, thinking, talking, writing, teaching stories that had given me this intuitive understanding of what makes stories meaningful or well told. I had totally, I totally had the skills to be the, that interpreter that Ira Glass was said was so key to making good radio. In other words, these podcasts that I had fallen in love with so long ago, I realized I could totally do that. Um, so I had this explosion of thoughts. Um, this is an actual document that I created for myself, which is a little bit embarrassing, honestly. Um, but I was thinking about the similarities, the overlap between literary analysis and literary journalism, which is another like word for what they're doing um, at This American Life and all those places. Um, so I wrote all this down just for myself, um, and I continue to think and art, like think about it, honestly, and, and um, try to articulate it. But on the left side, I'm thinking about the elements and structure of written literary analysis. And on the right, I'm thinking about elements of the structure and style of literary journalism and audio form. And at the bottom, I kind of synthesize these thoughts for myself into this statement. Both literary anal analysis and literary journalism can be seen as retellings of stories. And like, sometimes I just pause and think about that a lot because I'm like, do I really believe that? Is literary analysis, could I really honestly describe it as like what you're doing is you're like retelling a story? And like, I just honestly think yes. Um, we can talk more about that in the question section if you want to like happy to think through that um, always. Uh, so they can both be seen as retellings of stories and those retellings aim to convince the audience that the story matters because it conveys something relevant and meaningful to the audience's own life. Often it teaches us to be more empathetic and compassionate towards ourselves and others. Um, like I said, these thoughts are always circling around in my head and being refined <laughs> and they're totally on the theoretical level and like up for debate. Um, I love thinking about this. Um, but anyway, <laughs> for me, the next step was to actually learn the skills of making radio. Like the actual nuts and bolts of audio editing and interviewing and all kinds of other things. So literally the actual day, <laughs> When I listened to Ira talk about having no life, um, I got home from my walk and I immediately looked up Iowa Public Radio. And I thought, I lived in Iowa City, where the University of Iowa is, and I thought, no, they're going to be based in Des Moines, which is the capital of the state. And I was like so convinced, you know, this was kind of going to be a wild goose chase. But it felt like this moment of serendipity. I looked on the website. And not only did they have an office in Iowa City, the office in Iowa City was looking for interns. Um, so <laughs> um, the interns were to help out with their talk show team. They have these two live talk shows, Talk of Iowa and River to River. Um, and I, so I fired off an email that day to introduce myself and send along my resume. And um, I didn't really think anything would come of it. It felt like sending it into a void. But a couple of months later, um, I was on the job which um, to anyone who is like in the administration um, of, your, of your place, who's listening to this, um, this was technically illegal of me to do, uh, but I wouldn't have been able to make this project if I hadn't done it. Um, I didn't realize at the time that my contract stipulated I was not supposed to take on outside work while I was teaching in the department, and especially not while I was on fellowship. Um, but yeah, it was completely vital to learning the skills to be able to do this. And I wouldn't have been able to set myself up for a career in the radio industry if I hadn't done this internship. Um, 
because not only did I gain all these very practical skills that I needed to make radio, I also had the opportunity to build a portfolio of work that I could later show to prospective employers. Um, first and foremost, that included this podcast uh, called Lit City, which is in the middle of the screen. Um, I'm like gesturing towards it, you can't see. Uh, <laughs> which was about how Iowa City was the first UNESCO city of literature in the United States. Um, I got to build it from the ground up and even co-host it. And I think that I, I'm telling you this because if we're gonna build pipelines for humanities grad students to work in other fields outside of academia, I think we absolutely need to create more opportunities for them to do internships like this um, in fields while they complete their studies. Um, and I really do think it's important to kind of do it simultaneously because there's so many opportunities for cross-pollinization to occur um, in, your, in your brain when you're going back and forth between these two places. Um, but I'm gonna get off of my soapbox about it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take you now um, to part, part four, which is the final chapter of my presentation, um, in which I discuss building and defending the creature. So for me, the first step to making this project was arriving at the central conceit, the comparison of grad school to a Gothic novel. Once I was able to identify a connection between a literary genre that I had studied and could make a real, real scholarly commentary about it. Um, and wait, okay, so once I was able to identify a connection between a literary genre that I had studied and the lived experience of grad school that I wanted to discuss, everything else started to fall into place. But why the Gothic? If you've listened to the first episode of the podcast, you know that I wasn't originally planning to discuss the Gothic at all in my dissertation. Um, I had, but I had read Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho during comps and it just really stuck with me. Um, it was so, it was just over the top. <laughs> so frustrating at times, but so suspenseful and entertaining. Um, Radcliffe codified something so potent with her heroines trapped in crumbling castles by mysterious overlords that it became a formula that authors were emulating well into the 20th century, even today, I would argue. But what I really love about the Radcliffian Gothic is that it has something actually really insightful to say about the weaponization of knowledge, how knowledge can be withheld to keep people disempowered, like these heroines who are totally in the dark about whatever nefarious scheme it is that brought them th here to this castle. We also see how women in particular are socialized not to push too hard, even when they know knowledge is being withheld from them. And so if we look past some of the more annoying or repetitive parts of <laughs> Radcliffe and others, we see a truly terrifying portrayal of what it feels like to be totally powerless and have your entire fate rest in someone else's hands. And that really fit with what I wanted to say about grad school, about how the fortress of fear culture can really hold people back rather than help them progress professionally. So um, to, go, to go further into the nuts and bolts of like how I made this thing, how I built it, um, the general form that my chapters ended up taking was like the shape of a braided essay. Um, so a braided essay is one in which you have like three different story strands that you continually like overlay with each other. Like you talk about one part of story A and then you switch off to story B and then you switch to, to C and then A comes back or it, you go in whatever order you want. But um, anyway, uh, braided essay, the first strand of my braided essay form in each chapter was basically my readings of the Gothic novels. Um, for non-expert listeners to be able to listen and follow along in, in those chapters, I made sure to give really succinct overall summaries um, of what was going on in the stories before zooming in on particular scenes to closely analyze. And I would dramatize those scenes, which was really fun. Um, by using clips from audiobooks and incorporating music and other sound design elements so that they came to life. Then my analyses would come afterwards in my own voice and they would, I tried to stay pretty short and to the point and I wrote them for the ear so that listeners wouldn't get bogged down. The second strand, as you can see here, 
are the real life grad school horror stories, what I deemed the grad school gothic. For this strand, I would interview other grad students and use their voices, um, of course, with their permission, weaving my own voice in just to give context or to jump ahead in time. The third strand also incorporated a lot of interviews um, because that was where I reported on research and theories from the science of learning disciplines. Um, and that includes education, psychology, and sociology. And this third strand was really kind of like illuminating the other two and commenting on the other two and showing kind of what the other two had surprisingly in common with each other. Um, so after all, I conducted all of my interviews for each chapter to tell you a little bit about the process, um, I would transcribe all of, I would transcribe the interviews. Um, it would take hours <laughs> because often the interviews themselves were 60 or 90 minutes and it took me about three minutes to transcribe one minute of audio. Um, but it was a labor of love and once they were done, I would then start writing the episode um, and I'd insert excerpts from the transcribed interviews where the tape would go. And it was when I would ins insert um, clips from the books, from the novels, it was really cool because I could pull it out of the novel and it matches exactly. Like I already had a transcript of the audio book because it's the book. <laughs> ah, anyway, um, so I would, I would do all of this in writing first. Um, and then I would pass off these scripts or transcripts to my committee for their feedback at that point before I recorded anything because it's a lot easier to edit it on the page than it is to edit it once I've put it into the audio editing system and started producing it. Um, so once I got the green light from them, I'd go into production and then share the produced episode with them as well. And I was kind of going at a rate of about one chapter per semester, um, although I did squeeze like an introduction in there some somewhere <laughs> and a prologue. Um, okay. So what were the challenges? Um, I apologize for the stock image. I like really couldn't find a good image of a parking gate and it was very important that I find a parking gate specifically because um, that features prominently in one of the chapters. <laughs> um, so yeah, what were the, what were the, the parking gates? What were the roadblocks, the challenges? Um, the first was the issue of footnotes. How do you include footnotes in a spoken and not written project? For those of you who've listened, you'll know that the solution I came up with was to include a little ding sound um, where the footnote should go. Like in, if you were reading it, you would see a little number, but if you're listening to it, you get to the end of the line and you hear a little ding sound. Um, and it was, I chose, I, I, went through a lot of different ding sounds to find the right ding sound. And it ended up being one of those little bells that sits on a counter that you come by and you like ding the top of it when you want service, like somewhere, like a lot of businesses will have them out. Um, and I liked that ding sound because it's kind of like a very polite way of trying to get your attention and, and let you know that it's there. <laughs> um, okay. So there, the ding sound, you know, overcomes the challenge of the footnotes. Um, and then listeners were instructed at the beginning of um, the series that when they heard that sound, that meant there was a footnote and they could go find the footnote on the podcast website. So I did that. Um, you can go to the podcast website and read all the footnotes. Um, you will see there that they're at the bottom of each chapter page and they're listed not by number, but by timestamp of when the ding happens in the episode. And I also put like the sentence that I said that corresponds to the footnote um, in case you like can't recall exactly, you know, it's, that's a hard transition. So I tried to make it as easy as I could. Um, okay, so another big challenge, um, and I bet Judith will probably speak more to this. Um, another big challenge was that some of my committee members were skeptical about my incorporation of science of learning research and theory. They pointed out that I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an education scholar, which is all true. And I didn't say this at the time because it didn't occur to me until later, but I was thinking about it and I was like, why did I feel so compelled to like, use that research and talk about that research. And it's because, yes, no, I wasn't an education scholar. I wasn't a psych psychologist or sociologist, but I was a teacher. I had been teaching um, for years by that point. 
and um, I had a ton of classroom experience. And I had also done all of this pedagogical training, like as part of my program. Um, so I was really drawing a lot of sources from that, from the training and from the experience um, to talk about graduate training. Um, and ultimately, I think that most, if not all, English uh, dissertations do end up having some element of interdisciplinarity. Um, usually it's history or cultural studies or some other humanities subject. So um, conclusion, what I learned, so to return to the Scooby-Doo episode, um, <clears throat> I need some tea really quick. Okay, what I learned. So every Scooby-Doo episode ends the same way and it's with some villain being unmasked. So I guess in my Fortress of Fear episode, there really was one major villain. And that was the anxiety, the imposter syndrome, the fear, which I felt was heightened by the job market centric approach to training. I think grad students can be allowed and encouraged to do something that breaks out of the traditional job ad mold because let's face it, so few of us are gonna get anywhere near those jobs anyway. But the amazing news is that these skills are abundantly transferable to jobs outside of the academy anyway. And it would be known to everyone if we were just allowed to show it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. That was just terrific. There, there's muted applause here. <laughs> My screen is full of enthusiastic faces and responses. You probably haven't been following the chat, which has just sort of exploded over the last <laughs> hour with lots of comments. So Thanks, I, I want to I kind of turn it over to um, people to participate in the Q&A. So I'd like to invite Judith to unmute and join us. And people could, I think I'll just say, if you put up your hand, I'll call on you. Is that okay? You can wave or you can use an official hand raising function if you'd like to ask a question of either Anna or Judith. Uh, Christina, go ahead. Yeah, first I just wanted to, can you hear me fine? Yep. Wonderful. Yes. I wanted to thank you, first of all, because it was so fascinating. Um, and as somebody who's supervising students, um, many, uh, you know, some now who I see dealing with um, those, you know, many of the things you, you uh, described and, and feeling so very uh, unable in many cases to give them the kind of support that I know they need. Um, simply because I don't have that kind of knowledge which you, you've um, brought here. Uh, and simply because I feel so often we don't really believe that these skills are transferable. Um, I think we like to say that and, and we try to do that, but I'm not sure we all truly believe that enough or understand it enough or are able to really enunciate that. Um, so I just wanted to thank you, first of all. It has me rethinking very, many aspects of um, you know, the kind of training and thinking through that, that we do. Um, I work in pre-modern Japanese literature, uh, which means before the 19th century, and most of my students do that as well. Um, so my question for you is because um, we're so used to working in this process in which people give us uh, chapters or parts of the dissertation, and then we respond to that. And so much of that is just trying to get students to be in a good writing mode and producing and feeling good about writing and getting feedback on that and, and having a kind of flow there effectively. Um, and I'm wondering if you could both talk a little bit more about that revision process, particularly because I think what's for daunting for so many, I've helped with podcasts and I've had undergrads do podcasts, but it's that logistical aspect of it. Uh, and if you could talk more about that process of revision and how it worked, because we're so used to doing that in a written form and having the kind of platforms and ability to do that. Can you explain sort of what you handed in and, and what came back and then how, if something was, had to be significantly revised, was that a major setback in terms of time and logistics or how did that work? Thank you. Um, I will be happy to start off the answer for this one. So um, yeah, I, 
gave, I did give written, um, it worked for me to be able to give written stuff to my committee. Um, like I was saying towards the end there, like I knew that it would be a lot easier to revise the script than to revise the produced episode. Um, I should have put something like this in the presentation, like a screenshot of Pro Tools and what it looks like when you're in it. Um, some of you, maybe a lot of you are already familiar with that anyway, but um, it's like many different lines, many different tracks of sound um, that are all very in intricately uh, timed with each other. So the second you go to, um, like edit one track, then you might throw off everything else and all the other tracks. Um, so yeah, a lot easier to just edit on the page before you get anything recorded at all. Um, so that was my process. Um, I would write out what ended up being basically the transcript of my episode. It was a script that I was reading from when I recorded um, with all of the transcribed other voices where they actually go as well. And that was, it ends up looking, I mean, you can go and see these transcripts on the website. Like it ends up kind of just looking like a, a Microsoft, it's a Microsoft Word, <laughs> like, you know, your typical thing. So um, I would get comments back on that and then go make the chapter and then I would send the um, the audio version of the chapter as well. And oftentimes that was just kind of like to say like, look, here it is, I did it. Um, not a lot of people would comment on that. Um, and I, I feel like there was one other thing I was gonna tell you. Um, I don't know, it slipped, it slipped my mind. So I'll, I'll hand it off to Judith in case she has anything else to add. I'm sure. Um, can everybody hear me? Am I audible? Okay, yes. thank you. So um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that um, when I've talked to other faculty members about supervising this kind of a project, there's a lot of anxiety about their own expertise. So people will say like, oh, I don't feel qualified to do that. And it reminds me of talking to Nick Susanis, who was the creator of the first comic book dissertation. And he came and gave a talk at Iowa when we, we had a sort of like next gen PhD symposium that we were working on. And I remember him talking about one member of his, of his committee who was a very elderly woman that knew absolutely nothing at all about like comic books or graphic novels or anything, but who was enormously helpful to his process. So I think the, the delightful thing for a faculty member is letting the graduate student be the expert as they should be and not feeling, and that puts the graduate student in the position of being empowered to do the thing they really want to do and to, and to sort of show the faculty member, like, I don't know how to use Pro Tools at all. And, and to be honest, I actually don't remember looking at written versions of, of Anna's podcast. I mean, I must have because she's said, saying she got feedback on written versions, but I really wanted to, it to be a podcast. And I think it's important not to make people duplicate their work. So you shouldn't have to do a podcast and also a conventional 200 page dissertation. Though in a, in a sense, you know, she did because she has a transcript of it, but it was important to me to just experience it as a podcast, as a recording and not as the words on the page. I would just mention too, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, Anna is featured in Sonia Estima's dissertation, which is a multimodal dissertation about multimodal dissertations. And I'll, I'll um, next time Anna starts talking, I'll put a link in the chat because she told me I could do that. It's, it's quite interesting. I think that's a, a it, it also, um, she interviews people in four different fields that are doing multimodal dissertations and talks about the problems. Um, I will start talking now so you can drop that link in the chat because um, I thought of a couple of other things that I was forgetting to say in response to your question, Christina, um, about the logistics of the revision process. So, like I said, I would turn in the written form and then the produced form and at least one member of my committee told me that he responded differently when he heard it as opposed to when he read it. And like, that's really cool. Like it, ha it took on a different tone. Like he, um, I think it made very apparent the differences like uh, that the podcast form brings to the table that you don't get in just a written thing. Um, so that was one thing. And then also 
uh, you know, the script was really part of my production process. Like I, I would have written myself a script no matter what, even if I wasn't turning that into my committee. But for other people who are doing other forms of work um, in other media that wouldn't script it out like that, like they, I think that's not really ne necessarily the stumbling block that it needs to be because you just find a point at the production in the production process um, that it makes sense for them to pause and ask for feedback and incorporate feedback before like finishing the product, just like a written thing, you know, like um, every product has a production process. And so like just thinking like across genres and figuring out what point it makes sense to pause, get feedback, incorporate, and then go forward. I want to so pop in and say um, several people in the chat have been um, talking about actually doing podcast dissertations. So I, I wanted to ask a general question. How many people in attendance are actually in the middle of doing a podcast dissertation. Could we have a show of hands? Okay, I see I see a few. I know in the chat Sarah mentioned she's doing one and, and Lucy, maybe the two of you could tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. You, uh, this is Sarah. Sarah, you start. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is so lovely. Thank you so much for being so inspiring to take it to the max, actually. So I, I'm not doing that. I uh, am incorporating it in one of my chapters. Um, I have used podcasting. I study food system sustainability. And in one of my chapters, I'm using autoethnography as a way of uh, describing how, as an academic, I also have a role in changing behaviors, um, the normative aspect of sustainability, and that I'm influenced by different scholars and things like that. And so I created a series of podcasts along with some students that I work with um, that have become part of this chapter. And I'm kind of like exploring what that experience has been like through that chapter. And it's infused with parts of it, but to actually present it, I never even thought that that would be an option and maybe I'll go and talk to my committee or something <laughs> and try to explore that idea. But it's, this is really, really inspiring. It's so much work though, like putting effort into creating a podcast. There's, there's so many technical details. Um, I can't imagine what it would be like to put a whole dissertation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, hello, you my name is... Yes. Hey, I, my name is Lucy. I'm an international student. So I'm from the States. I'm in Miami right now. But like, yeah, I got I'm in the gender, race, sexuality, social justice um, department. And so I got, just got put over to the creative track of the dissertation. And yes, I am going to be um, turning my entire dissertation into a podcast. I am studying Black genders and Black sexuality. Um, like you, I have no interest in being um, a tenure professor. And so I've already kind of started like remixing and doing my own thing out in the world um, as a public um, scholar and public intellectual, which is really important to me. I know that you're not supposed to say that in the academy. You're not supposed to want to do that. Um, but that's what I want to do. Like, I come from an organizing background. I come from a, a social justice background. And so I know, like, when I've taught um, how my students respond to podcasts and things of that nature. And so um, I just want to, my idea is going to be, be be talking about like how black people are inherently queer and how that became and what does that mean for us and um so there is both a visual component and a, a podcast component and so thank you so much for your presentation this is really awesome really inspiring i'm also like a podcast junkie so i didn't know about your podcast so i'll be all over it and so like i have lots of questions lots of comments i don't want to take up too much space but like this is i'm literally revising my perspectives right now and i was just asked some really hard questions around like i i i right now i have it scripted out that i have seven episodes on chapters and each chapter is like a, a is an ode to a black feminist thinker so i have like um a horton spillers kathy cohen um, different thinkers that have animated my thinking and my understanding of black genders and black sexualities um, and so um, this was really 
exciting. And so I'm trying to, I was, before I knew about your podcast, I was trying to fashion myself behind um, Dissect, um, which um, they do that serialize of each album. So I was thinking about Dissect and I was also thinking about um, another podcast I can't think of right now. So, um, but like, yeah. And I started listening to the Lolita podcast, which sounds like it could have been someone's thesis that they that they talked about the Lolita book. And so I'm listening to lots of things for inspiration. Um, but yes, I am in the middle of doing, thinking this and um, very soon, hopefully I will start actually doing the process. Uh, best of luck to you. Thank you so much for sharing. That project sounds really fascinating. And I'm always down to think about um, structure and form of episodes and like, how you can do like the braided essay style for instance and like put in what what are your different strands like what what do you want to be commenting on each other um so if you ever want to have a conversation like that like i feel free to reach out i, like, I do and i will thank you. okay we've got <laughs> a couple more questions lining up gabrielle hi thank you Chris yeah um uh, anna thanks for your your great presentation also uh, let's say for those comments and your work too um and others that are in the genre or getting into the genre making our own one here um I, actually kind of a I'll, I'll stick to a more straightforward question here um i thought on your first slide it said that your podcast was in was part of your dissertation so was your your entire dissertation was assessed as podcast episodes like there was not like an it wasn't accompanying a written document or anything like that it wasn't like a component no it wasn't a component it was the whole thing um okay. and the, the the written part was just like the transcripts of the, the episodes print, okay yeah. yeah okay um i'm excited to ask you other questions in the subsequent uh smaller thing after the break thanks okay craig if you're still here you're next your question is next. Oh. oh, hey, thanks, thanks, Mary. I can wait until the next, the next, the the breakout room as well. So I'm happy to wait. Uh, um, not a burning question. Oh. I've just really enjoyed and am inspired by uh, Anna's presentation. Um, I'm also I'm doing a master's thesis. I will be uh, I'm working with the Spoken Web Project. Um, which is a consortium of uh, labs uh, that uh, are digitizing troves of literary um, tapes and analog tapes and remediating them. And my podcasts will take the form of a series of remediated analog tapes uh, of poets, uh, in particular uh, poets uh, from the Black Mountain um, and Tish uh, poetic movements from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and so I was just really keen to hear that the whole thing was a, uh, a dissertation. The, her dissertation didn't, it didn't have a, a it, she didn't have to double her work and, and um, do a, a companion essay or something alongside. Um, so I'm, I'm also, I guess, but my question in particular was annotation. And I know we're working in the Spoken Web Project with Audi Annotate. Um, that uses uh, basically an, where it's an, uh, a tool, a DH tool, a digital humanities tool that allows you to annotate audio files. Um, and I'm just wondering if, um, and I, I just see a lot of possibility in terms of uh, supporting the, uh, the audio and the script through this sort of annotation uh, tool. I'm wondering if, if there's any tools that Anna had used that might be akin to something like, like that. Um, that sounds really interesting and I would love to see what that looks like. Um, no, I, is the short answer. I didn't use anything to like annotate the audio files, though I did consider, um, doing something like that at one point because, uh, there is a guy at Iowa in the journalism department, Judith, help me remember his name. I won't be able to remember it. Okay. <laughs> maybe it'll come oh, I, to I me. can, I can maybe look it up while you're, Daniel um, Lathrop. Is yeah, it Daniel? yeah, there you go. Thank you. Daniel Lathrop um, in the journalism department him. at Iowa is working on something similar. Um, and I, I am not exactly sure what his is going to look like or if it's already done. I have no idea where he's in the process, but he's he, uh, while I was there, he was developing a thing 
where I'm pretty sure how it was going to work is like if you're listening to an online player of um, audio, when you get to a point, like for instance, if you got to one of my footnotes, it would pop up a little um, text window that would have the text in it to annotate like that part of the audio, I guess. Um, and it sounds like that's very similar to what you're talking about. Um, but the best I can do is say like, no, I didn't use that. I'm not familiar. And, but I do know about this guy and his work and maybe that's interesting to you. Yeah, very, very interesting. Thanks, Anna. Um, and I, I could share the Audi Annotate uh, re resource with you. They've got a GitHub that uh, can, can walk you through what it does. And I think um, you might, it might be of interest to a lot of people here. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Greg. Uh, speaking of resources, I just want to draw people's attention to a toolkit that the Grad Academic Assistance for the Hub assembled that is about doing academic podcasting. And it has resources that are general, and then it has some advice for people who are based at UBC, um, equipment and resources they can access. So that's at publichumanities.ubc.ca. All right, any other questions? Judith. Um, I just, uh, sorry to keep kind of saying the same thing, but I feel really strongly about the don't duplicate projects point. I just think that is a really, really important thing. And it's utterly unreasonable to ask somebody to work in an experimental form, whether that be a podcast or a kind of elaborate DH project, like the kind of thing Amanda Visconti did with the Infant Ulysses. And then to say, oh, and all oh, by the way, do what everybody else did too. I mean, the level, the amount of artistry that goes into creating a podcast like Anna, it's not, she's not one of those podcasts that somebody just starts talking and records themselves. I mean, the the thought that goes into the the three three part structure, the voicing of it, everything. I, I just, I will say this over and over and over again, it should not be an add on. It, the, the new dissertation is a new dissertation mm -hmm. and it's it, it shouldn't be doing two different things. Thank you. It seems like it overlaps with uh, concerns that people have for DH dissertations as well, Absolutely. where people end up being expected to do double because some people perceive it as not the labor in itself. So right. there's a, a question from Blake. Thanks, Judith. Hi, thank you. I'll turn on my video. Um, I wanted to say thanks so much for this amazing uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if most people on here are in the middle of their degree, but I actually just finished and defended in December. Um, but the second I saw the ad, thank you. <laughs> the second I saw the advertisement today for today, I immediately got excited about could I, and I wanted to ask you like, do you think that people could podcast a dissertation that's now complete? Um, mine is text, uh, lots of photographs. It's a photographic inquiry. Um, I suppose they could be described. Um, I was just wondering, you know, if, if that was something you could advise, you know, is that possible or like, well, how in the world would, could I do that? Um, I feel like I've heard of somebody else doing the like retrospective podcast from a dissertation thing. Um, uh, I can like put you in touch with that person. Uh, I've got to dig through my email to like find that thread again. Um, but yeah, like, of course it's totally possible. Um, there, I feel like there are better people at talking about this than me about just like, um, whether the podcast form is right for like, like I can't wrap my mind around doing photographs, but that doesn't mean that like you can't do it and do it in some really creative and interesting way that like, obviously I never would have thought of before. Um, but yeah, like <laughs> the short answer is like, yes, I think you could do that. Um, in terms of like thinking about what it might be like, um, I, it, that's part of the, like, that's the fun of it. Like, that's the work of it. That's the process. So if you're, if that's something you're interested in, then like, yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yeah. If, if you end up finding out, that would be great if you can share. Um, 
And I don't know if you mentioned this early because I hopped on a few minutes late, but how did you, you did the ding for footnotes, but how did you work with references, citations? Yeah, the citations just kind of ended up being silent. <laughs> they were there. Um, and you could see them if you went to um, the transcript. But also, like, when I was citing somebody, I would work it into the sentence, you know, I'd be like, you know, like so and so said in her 1996 article or whatever. Um, just, yeah, I would try to make sure that like verbally, I was referencing the works that I was um, referring to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Your work is really inspiring. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Curtis, I see your hand. You have a question. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start the video as well. Um, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Williams, for um, this incredible presentation. Um, it is very inspiring. Um, I'm currently in my I'm currently in my comprehensive exams doing the last one, and so you know my prospectus deadline uh, will also be looming um, soon. Um, and you know I, I don't think that I would go uh, podcast as the entire dissertation just because I I am someone that does want to go along the you know the academic um, route just because you know my my passion really is for teaching and pedagogy, um, but. You know, part of my passion also is, you know, this, this public scholarship stuff, um, you know, making, you know, our specialty knowledge uh, accessible. Um, you know, when, when my wife drags me to um, anime conventions, um, because I also do, I do pre-modern Japanese lit as well. I work with Christina Laffin um, on that. But, uh, you know, I do educational presentations on, you know, some cultural topics um, that always are well attended, which is fun. But so I'm, I'm very interested in, even though, you know, I want to kind of follow this traditional path. I want to kind of forge these ways of making public scholarship a part of that path to try and normalize, you know, academics in taking on this work rather than just, you know, always publishing, publishing, publishing. Um, and so uh, I was just, I was wondering um, if you, uh, if either of you like had any thoughts on, you know, as your, uh, you know, you were talking about the transferability of skills and then, you know, uh, Dr. Laffin talked about how, you know, sometimes we don't believe that. Like, if you had any tips for convincing, you know, hiring boards, convincing tenure, uh, tenure committees um, about the value of these types of public scholarships and public works that we do. Um, just if you had any, you know, insight or any, you know, things that didn't work or did work or, you know, anything, um, that'd be very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to convincing tenure committees, um, about the skills being transferable or about the value of, um, non-traditional scholarly work? I think more about like convincing them about the value, um, of it. Yeah. Uh, if you had any thoughts, that would be, I'd very much appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, um, I would love to hear Judith answer this question too, but, um, I guess like it, I think that what it just really takes is like a, a cultural shift because like, I think that there was um, a question that I saw for the other panel that was something about like, do you wait until a job ad comes along to allow your um, graduate advisees to do uh, non-traditional scholarly work or do you let them do the non-traditional scholarly work and then hope that the job ad comes along and I guess my answer is like for the people who write the job ads like <laughs> um, you, like you have the power to to consider things that aren't just traditional scholarship um, so I mean I would think that if you're reading a million job ads or a million um, applications uh, with a million different uh, dissertations of the traditional format that when you get one that is different, then it might actually stand out and it might um, get you thinking in a way that you weren't thinking before. Um, so yeah, I would, I was, I, I would hope that non-traditional dissertations would make people stand out in that context um, to actually become better candidates for uh, academic jobs. I mean, yeah, Judith, do you have any other thoughts? Um, 
I, ha I do have a thought, but I, I might be wandering too far from the original question. So, uh, Curtis, feel free to, to sort of like steer us back if you have a point of, more pointed questions. But one thing I find frustrating is um, sometimes um, when you talk to faculty about helping graduate students prepare for jobs outside the academy, they'll sort of, you know, raise their hands and be like, oh, I would really love to do that, but I'm not trained to do that. Like, I don't have the training to help and I don't know how to do a resume as opposed to a CV. And I don't find that kind of claim like very compelling because I feel like we all train ourselves to do things we don't know how to do all the time. And like most of us have had the experience of going in pretty cold and teaching a class that we're really pretty ill-equipped to do until we actually teach ourselves how to teach that class. So it doesn't seem that different for, for faculty members to start thinking about how they could be working with their graduate students from the beginning on, you know, having both a resume and a CV and thinking about how you can foreground particular skills. So um, yeah, so that, that may not be exactly on point, but um, I'll add to that, um, maybe, sorry, taking us even further away from the point, but besides like learning the things themselves, like teaching, like Judith, you're saying they ought to be um, capable of doing because they do it a lot, like connecting them to people that they might know who are working in that industry or like helping them find a mentor that's working in that industry, giving them the skills to like start networking with the people who do know, like what a good, for instance, like radio industry resume looks like, um, that's also really invaluable. Uh, and uh, I was gonna add something to that, but now I forgot what it was. Um, yeah, I think the point you made earlier about the internships is yeah. that, that, that larger structural change, like I would love to see graduate students have opportunities to have funding that does not involve teaching, that involves working elsewhere on campus. And yeah. in response, I'm seeing a comment too from Letitia Henville, which I is a great comment, mm -hmm. um, that there are staff on campus who are exper experts in that. And I, I think that's, we have that too, I think that's true, but I think it needs to not be um, like totally like the lines. I think like the faculty need to be thinking about these issues also and interacting personally with some of the, the staff members that are that have these kinds of expertise yes and also like nice the segue. idea oh sorry one last quick go thing ahead about go that. ahead Anna. yeah um the idea of also having a, maybe one of your fourth or fifth members being someone from the industry that like you're thinking about going into um and maybe that's like a mentor that you gained while you were at your internship for instance you know like that's also i i don't know what people what rules are at universities and if everyone on your committee has to have a phd but like maybe that's something that could be argued at the grad college level um or or, or the college or university level or whatever to like make this case for helping grad students find jobs outside of academia. I want to turn the mic over to Letitia Hanville because she's somebody at UBC who's an amazing resource for people who are interested in doing those internships and can tell us all more about it. I couldn't agree more with Anna's point that, you know, people who aren't academics have expertise that can be a benefit, whether that's lived experience, whether that's professional expertise, whether that's subject matter expertise in the broader area of significance, I just, I couldn't agree more. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the people at UBC in the room know that this paid internship thing is a thing that we do at UBC. Uh, there's PhD co-op and there's the arts amplifier. Um, and to, I've not prepared a presentation or anything, but to be blunt, there is um, the economy is being propped up at the moment um, by some institutions that want the economy not to fail. So there's a lot of money for students out there at the moment. And if you want to do this stuff, uh, we want to talk to you. So we're at the Arts Amplifier and this is what we do. That's all I wanted to say. This is, um, Anna, it's been a really lovely presentation. Um, and to think that um, literary studies folks um, have been stuck in one form for so long, even though we know that form and content are like things that work together. It's just, um, it's really lovely to, to see you break the forms. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to add to what Letitia just said that another um, 
form of encouragement at UBC for graduate students who are trying to think of different ways to share their scholarship is the new public engagement award that is being offered by the hub. We have two awards this year, brand new. One is for faculty and the other is for graduate students and contingent faculty and postdocs. And it's basically a cash award that you can apply for if you feel that you have a record of sharing your research with a broader public. So take a look at the website and you'll see more information there. Thank you. Yeah, there's a link there posted by Heather, so you can follow that link for more information. Um, Lucy, did you have your hand up again? I thought I saw, maybe you were just enthusiastically waving and nodding. And <laughs> but yeah, do you I'm very animated. Have something to, no, say? I have to say? No. Oh, okay. Not right okay. now. Uh, all right. Um, anyone else? Okay. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you, Judith and Anna, for this part of the programming. We're going to take a break for about 40 minutes, give people who are at their dinner hour a chance to uh, refuel. And then at 4 p.m. Vancouver time, we'll come back to the individual chat rooms or sorry breakout rooms that have been set up um, these are for students to bring their more private personal questions about the process of doing a non-traditional dissertation to anna so she'll be in the grad breakout room and in the other breakout room judith will answer questions that might come more from the perspective of an advisor or a supervisor who who needs some insights into how to work with a student who's proposing a, a non-traditional dissertation. So thank you everyone for coming to this first part of the program. The links are in the chat, so we will leave this room open for a few minutes so that you can get organized and grab those links if you haven't already. And we'll see some of you in, in 40 minutes. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.